Welcome to Interceptor Beyond Podcast. My name is Arthur, and today on the episode we have a post-punk band from Iceland, Kaelen Mikla. We also have the first non-musician, Kinat Soleil, as known as Merge Babe, that's been working with Kaelen Mikla since the very beginning. And we have Bille Ballo. If you know him, you know him. If you know his Infernal Majesty, you know Bill. All the people were super nice, and it was a mega pleasure to talk to them. Recorded at Arena Wien. It was a sold out show, it was packed, the show was great, the whole evening was awesome. All right, the time codes are in the description. Don't forget to follow this podcast on Spotify or any platform if you dig it. And rate the show. Please rate the show on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. All right, and now let's talk to Kyle Mikla. I am Leve, the vocalist of Kellan Mikla. I am Solveig, the synth player of Kellan Mikla. I am Maki, uh, the bass player of Kellan Mikla. How was yesterday? Tell me, what, what was the special occasion yesterday? Um, it was the biggest show we have ever done in Budapest. Uh, How many? 2,500 sold out. How did you feel? Um, very good. How did you feel afterwards? Even better. <laughs> How did you celebrate? Uh, well, we danced a bit. Yeah. Like after the show, we were like, yay. <laughs> and we didn't celebrate in any other special way. Um, I think. We had some beers, we got flowers on, that were given to us, and like we got some gifts as well. And yeah, we were just extremely happy. And yeah, mm -hmm. it was fun. Congratulations. I mean, but it's just only the beginning. We know, we know that. The next one, which which is the big one for you? Which, which, which be number would be the next biggie? Uh, I mean, I think that the show in London is going to be pretty big and also New York and in America with Ville. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it's just going to go upwards from here. Yeah, and we need to mention that you're right in the middle of the European tour. Yeah. And uh, uh, in April, you go to North America. Yes. Yes. We do. So, could you please tell me about the making of Underkaldum Nörderjösum? Underkaldum Nörderjösum. Yes. Yes. Well, we wrote the whole album during COVID because we were just, of course, stuck at home. And like the name, Under Kölden Norderljosum, it means under the cold northern lights. And it focuses a lot about uh, Icelandic folklore and like stories. Each song is kind of a story that can happen under the cold northern lights. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Then we uh, went to the studio with our friend. Uh, his name is Bardi. He's a very, very good uh, musician. Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, he's visiting, or he's going to come to the show in France, mm -hmm. in Paris. Um, and yeah, we spent, I think, almost a year. Or how long? Yes. We a spent year a year in the studio with yeah. the recording and mixing. And and it was very nice to have him produce the album because he, he has a lot of good ideas and wanted to try everything out and not stop until it was perfect. How did you come to know Barty? Uh, well... We're a big fan of his music, and then, uh, yeah, I, he, he contacted us some years ago and asked if we wanted to collaborate on a song, and we did that on uh, Noft After Noft, mm -hmm. the, the third album. Actually, I, I remember I met him, first it happened, I met him in a bar, or I saw him in a bar, and I was just going to go to him and fan fangirl to him, like tell him that I love his music, and I just said, hi, and then he turned around and said, Hi, I want to make music with you. Uh, <laughs> something dark, and then we, yeah, well, then we talked to him. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> and how was it? Uh, like how? When was it? Like uh, how? How long before you started production of this? Uh, it was the song of the uh, album before "Not After Not," the title mm -hmm. song. Uh, so, two thousand what? Eighteen. Eighteen. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so this was probably two thousand seventeen or something, and then we've just been friends ever since. And how how did it influence your recording process? How did he contribute to the creation of this album? Well, it was the first time pretty much that we ever went to a studio because uh, like uh, Kala Mikla, our self-titled album, and uh, Note After Note, we both recorded in, in our garages where we just uh, built a small studio ourselves and just did everything very DIY and just were learning as we went. So they're all both, yeah, they're both kind of DIY recorded. So yeah, they are both <laughs> garage recorded. And that was kind of the first time we had the, a long time to actually be in a real studio and experiment and learn new stuff and learn new sounds and new instruments. And so it was just, yeah, it was a very, we learned a lot. That was really fun for us to 
see to do it like the professional way, not like we love the DIY as well, but it was fun for us to experience this. Yeah. And and also because he has so many more instruments than we do. And it was really fun to like try everything out. And like we, we already had written the whole album and like but each song we went over every sound and we th- thought about if we should replace it with another synth or like this weird instrument or like um synth to an amp to a weird thing you know we were just experimenting so much and i loved it so cool i was just being like a, being a kid in a candy store kind of like <laughs> to get to play around with things that you never get to like touch uh, mm-hmm. normally yeah many he had so many crazy instruments yeah that we we was the most exotic instrument or something crazy i think the water phone probably it's an extremely expensive instrument that makes this kind of screeching sound that you hear in horror movies oh is it it analog yeah Mm -hmm. something old probably from the 70s or 60s something with a tape inside no it's like uh it has you play it with a bow and it's made from metal yeah Mm -hmm. Is that with the things like small? Uh, yes. things? Yeah, around yes, yeah. Uh, uh, different sizes of uh, poles yeah. from metal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. makes a very eerie, creepy sound. Mm-hmm. I oh. think they're quite rare yeah. as well. Like this, it's hard to get one, and they're quite expensive and very rare. So that was cool to get to play with that. <laughs> Did you use it on the album? Yes. Yeah. Uh, like the first song on the album, for example, we used so many weird, weird noises. We used the water phone. We also used um, the sound of biting an apple a lot and um, just to, yeah, like also s- pieces of paper yeah and like the the glitches of something from an app we repeated that many times and made the r- weird rhythm and yeah it's a scary song it's a yes. horror song yes i mean the album i really love the album like i i was listening to it before you be- because I didn't know if I would be able to interview you, so and the tickets were already sold out. So, uh, but I still like the music, you know. And and then I had to intensely listen deep into it in the last one and a half days. I really love it. It's a, it's a great production, great music. It's really good, great album. Hey, thank you. Uh, and uh, I know. So you're going uh, on tour in April, and I know that you were uh, concentrating a lot on this tour for rehearsals, I mean. So I have plans to make the new album uh, in the near future, after April tour. Yeah, I mean, after the tour, we have some festivals in Iceland and also a festival in Finland called Sideways Festival. But after that, we're going to go to the countryside and just ride together. Mm -hmm. Isolate ourselves from uh, people and the city and just be uh, in the nature and for like 10 days or something and just write, write, write because we have been so much on the road. We haven't had much time to write, but I feel like we write very quickly as soon as we get time together mm-hmm. and we're just gonna gonna do something cool this summer. Yeah, camp. Boot camp, yes. Because also like when we go home from tours, it's not the first thing that you want to do is to like, hey, let's play the songs again, <laughs> you know, but the... Uh, and the city is so busy and there's always something coming up and it's difficult to focus. So we're going to isolate. Yeah, n- nature uh, and being connected to nature is a big part of your band. It's mm-hmm. a big part of your personality and how it affects. And how it affects your music. So you mentioned that you want to go outside of the city. Uh, so how do you feel in the city? Is like being disconnected a little bit from the nature? I mean, the the city, you can still see the mountains and the ocean, and it's it's nice too. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's more busy, I guess. Uh, I knew at some point you were living, some of you, not in Iceland, in Berlin. Uh, I know for sure. Oh, so, so I think you yeah, did. Yeah, yeah. Lucky. yeah. And uh, so uh, when you record the new album, or you go back to Iceland, or you used to find a place somewhere outside? Uh, yeah, we're going to be... In Iceland. And in, we recorded in, in Iceland also. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, when, when I was watching your music videos, I was like, okay, here we go, the music videos of Iceland. You know, you can't top that because mm-hmm. everybody wants to shoot music videos in Iceland because of the, the, the nature. By the way, like you're touring around, right? So like uh, around worlds because you toured in, you know, everywhere. North America, I know, like last year also. 
being from Iceland with the great nature, what, what, what countries or what places uh, had the most impact on you, on your personality, what influenced you, or maybe like uh, had an, uh, an emotional effect? I mean, the, the mountains, like the Alps are crazy to drive through, you know, when we're driving on tours, it's always a uh, highlight, but um, I'm always very surprised being in the South, uh, South North America, you know, uh, like Middle America, what? yeah, and um, yeah, like seeing palm trees and deserts and weird stones, it's, yeah. I love it, it's so crazy. I really like uh, kind of Mediterranean nature because I find it looks a bit like a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. So I like that. It's my, I like the trees in the in those uh, countries. No, I mean it's a difficult question because yeah. you need to remember the whole tour, and you're in the middle of the of the tour. You need to re you need time. How are you going to relax between the tours, between this tour and the April tour? We only have one week at home, so oh. I yes. think we will not relax or. I would like to go to the swimming pool or to a hot tub. Yeah, I want to go to the countryside to a small cabin and paint or something. Without people. Are you like, a, uh, do you feel comfortable around many people? I mean, 2,500 people yesterday is one thing, <laughs> it's a stage thing. Yeah. Uh, but how do you feel being around uh, many groups of people? Yeah. I, I mean, we. I think it's okay. Like it can get a little overwhelming because uh, now the shows we're playing are bigger. Usually, we always want to go to the merch table and say hi to people. We think it's really important to just like uh, be uh, just say hi to like the people that are supporting us and stuff like that. But like when it's now it's suddenly getting so big so fast that it's kind of intimidating going out in such a big crowd. It can make you feel like small and st uh, it, it can stress me out actually. It's like we're used to, we were more used to like smaller th shows and then it was much more personable, but mm -hmm. yeah, it can, it's, it's amazing, but it can also be quite intimidating, I guess. Yeah. I have a very hard time with big groups. I, it's not my, my favorite, but yeah, but it's awesome being in such amazing venues and yeah. I mean, we just had an experience when you let us in outside of the venue, there were some fans already coming to, yes. to give you presents yes. and stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, it personally, like, whoa, okay. I, I mean, I've never experienced that. I mean, you're already like famous and stuff. It's more usual for you, you know, but wow, some people <laughs> running up to you, <laughs> screaming your name. Yes, it seems absurd, I think. Like, I'm, we're not used to it yet. <laughs> yeah. And and also what I like, because we always, yeah, we very often go to the murder table and we want to be human. We want to talk to everybody and like personally connect to people and some like some people that have been coming to the shows they come to maybe like five shows on the tour and we start to get to know them and I, th I think it's really fun and they like sometimes give us like small presents maybe from their country or something and it's so nice <laughs> i will uh, later i will ask Ville regarding the popularity because he experienced uh, the the sudden rise to fame because this is really important for your exp you're experiencing this at, at the moment because you exist already since 2013 yes. and it was slow uh, g um, you were g g uh, rising to the fame let's say this slowly and then it immediately like for example yesterday in one of the proofs how it went up and most probably it will go even h faster than you think um, Yes. How you do you feel about that? You, I mean, it's, it's good, or you're like a little bit afraid, or, or, or you haven't processed what's going on yet. Mm, I guess it's yeah, we haven't processed it. Not being on tour is like being not on the same planet and on the same time zones as anyone else. It's like it's so weird that time home goes forward and you're living like this other kind of life. So I think maybe when we get from the U.S. tour, we're gonna have like a month to process and breathe and agreed yeah <laughs> agreed uh, uh i listened to one of the interviews that you did in january which one one of the fresh ones you i think you were in finland yes, it was for the stalker magazine yeah that was, yeah. yeah and uh, it was right at the beginning of the it was second show or third show maybe it was right and then you um didn't know how it would go uh touring with villa's team and uh uh, so I would uh, want to ask now, how is it going like as a tour? Uh, what have you learned on this tour so far? Well, we've learned that they are 
great people and we've become very good friends now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yes. And, and the shows, it's just been like more than we could have wished for. It's been so nice. Yeah, they're just, we've been treated really nicely and like they uh, totally welcome us and are just, yeah, just really happy because like when you meet someone and now you're supposed to travel together and work together for a few months, like it, you can think like, oh no, what if they're like not nice or something, <laughs> but then they're all like the sweetest ever and they're super supporting us and super, yeah, just treat us like equals and we're just... And they're fun. <laughs> There's fun to hang out with them. They're really nice guys and just everyone in the crew. Yeah, I saw it on social media because I was following you, no matter if we're <laughs> going to have this interview or not. I was following how you, the process is going. Everything is super positive, super nice. It's like really like, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you were in good hands in a way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's, it's so important because it's, I mean, we go on stage for, we go on stage for half an hour, they go on stage for one and a half hour. But then there is, what, 22 hours left. Mm -hmm. And it's so important to uh, just have a nice time and, and get to know people and, and see stuff and experience. Yeah, you go to restaurants, you do sightseeing together with the crew. We went to a spa yesterday with them. It was great. Uh, in uh, Budapest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think what, what I've personally learned is also to just it, when it, there is a lot of people and a lot of feelings and everybody has their own mind. It's important to just say, now I am sad and I want to sit alone. And then everybody's like, okay, that's good for you. Uh, we'll be there when you are up again. And then like also, yeah, just support each other. Because uh, touring yes. is, is, it takes a toll on you physically, uh, mentally, emotionally. It's, it's draining, even though it's extremely fun, but it has like peaks and valleys. So I think uh, friendship and supporting each other is the most valuable thing you can learn. Because mm -hmm. um, if we are not supporting each other or like being as great friends as we are, I don't think we were we were making it, you know, we, we wouldn't um, last. Yeah, oh, I, I meant what she was saying. <laughs> <laughs> All right, excellent. Academic, I don't want to bother you too much. You need to do play a show later. Uh, could you please give me uh, one Kellen Mikla song that is a good introduction to your band? Solsteder. Oh, 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 
Thank you, Karen Mikler, for this beautiful song. And now, let's talk to Merch Babe. I'm Ken Natsole, also known as Merch Babe. On Instagram. On Instagram. All the Merch Babe on Instagram. <laughs> yes, please. Because there's not many interviews about you, uh, we need to do a quick uh, basic stuff of who you are. Who you are? What do you do? Um, I'm a graphic designer and working mostly in the music industry, making album covers and merch and stuff like that. And I'm also a merch manager for Canon Mikla and tour with them, I sell the merch, design the merch. Yes, you designed the logo for Canon Mikla and you designed at least the logo. You designed a lot of stuff for them. Yeah, I've everything. I've designed, yeah, <laughs> everything. For them. Yes, you designed everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I would consider, I even wrote in my notes, uh, a fourth member of Canon Mikla because you you kind of influence the visual style. Yeah, they, they sometimes refer to me as that. <laughs> nice. All right. So how come you are with Canon Mikla? So we've been friends since high school and I hadn't started studying graphic design yet, but Loewe, like they just started the band and Loewe asked me to make a logo for them. And because I was, yeah, I was friends with them before in high school and I made this logo and then it went on their album cover. And then a couple, like a year or two later as kind of a payment, because they didn't have money to pay me then as payment for making the logo, they took me with them on their second ever tour. And, and then, then how it started. Yeah, and then I've been touring with them ever since. Oh, so you've been with them for a long time. How, how long? Since the very beginning? Yeah, so they just had their 10-year birthday the other day. And I actually went back onto my drive and checked when I made this first logo. And it was only like three months or something after. So it was in 2013. Yeah, And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you, because you've been in this field of music industry for a long time. How did it change? Have you noticed anything? Because another reason why I wanted to talk to you, because I saw your Instagram stories post regarding the pricing of merchandise that's going up because of the cuts that the venue has to take. Yeah, that was something that came with playing a bit bigger venues. The first time I noticed it was on a tour we did early 2020, and there was only one show that was, yeah, the, it's basically, you come to the venue and the venue makes you use their merch sellers and then they take a percentage. And, and quite a lot. Yeah, it's uh, on this tour, it's been yeah, 20 or 25%. The uh, VV merch mentor said as some go up to 40%, mm -hmm. which is brutal. And it's, uh, you know, off gross, gross sales, like the you know, it's not off of our profit. So if we pay a certain amount to make something, you know, they still get to take 25% off the whole mm -hmm. price or, yeah. And yeah, so we have to make everything more expensive. And apparently, yeah, it's gotten much more uh, common since COVID. Yeah, yeah. I just saw today on Loudwire, I think the band Monuments, they had, I think Monuments, I'm not sure, maybe. Yeah, I, the, idea, the problem was that they had this problem in Italy recently, and they had to cancel all merch in Greece because they realized that the percentage was so high, it was easier to ask people to buy something online than to buy it at the venue because it was too much. It was more than half went to the venue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because yeah, they take maybe 25% and then it's also like taxes, taxes. Like 20 to 30. Yeah. So it's, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I understand the bands I've heard about that they maybe sell stuff outside before or after the show, stuff like that. Um, if this was a headline tour, we might do something like that, but we're putting our merch up also to advertise now. But yeah, it's tricky and it sucks because I think I've only just super recently seen people actually talk about it. And but what people see is like, oh, everyone like you're charging 40 euros for a T-shirt like that's crazy or whatever, you know, but nobody knows that it's not our fault. <laughs> you should put a huge sign. It's not our fault. Yeah. <laughs> because when we were like uh, with Julian, we were here uh, uh, recording interview with Clutch and Tiger Cup and uh, Greenland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, we were surprised how, how high the prices were for the merch. Mm -hmm. I was like, whoa, well, I mean, I got drunk and I got, I bought it anyway. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> 
but still, you know, we were shocked. And I mean, we kind of knew, or I kind of knew that something is going on, but still, uh, probably there are going to be a new way of dealing with stuff regarding this, maybe selling online or some QR codes with, with, with discounts. Have you thought about it? Yeah. Um, yeah, it would be possible to sell, you know, less things at the venue and then I don't know, but you know, you sell so much more just having it there, obviously, but it's tricky. I mean, I was also, when I saw the prices of the merch on this tour, I thought they were high as well. I was like, well, that's so high. And then, but then I am slowly realizing, oh, but they have to, you know. I haven't checked the prices. We just passed by the merch table. I haven't seen the price. What's, what's the, what's the price for Hukal and Mikla t-shirt? Because I'm going to buy one. <laughs> the t-shirts uh, are 40 euros. We. I need to get drunk. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't expect that. Uh, <laughs> You're like, never mind. <laughs> Shit. Uh, no, but we also, because um, we're supporting on this tour, we price match. We are asked to price match, which is yeah, also... I understand, not to compete with the... Yeah. 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 It's, but in the end, at first I was like kind of annoyed about it, but in the end we make... But, I mean, we don't sell that much merch on this tour, but we make 40 euros a shirt, so it helps us a little bit. <laughs> but yeah, it's strange when last tour we were selling them for 25. Yeah, I was hoping for that. <laughs> I didn't. Yeah, I think I, ch I, ch I think I checked online, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah you know, I might buy online <laughs> so that the, the venue is not going to get it. <laughs> but tonight I'm selling myself, so there's no concession. Uh -huh. Ah, okay. I understand. All right. So you've been uh, traveling uh, with Kalen kind of Mikla for a long time. How was the tour so far for you? Are you I mean, you already have a lot of experience, but still, like, how is it going so far? This tour? Yeah. Yeah, it's been really nice, actually. Um, is there something different from the previous tours? Yeah, it's, a, it's different doing like a headline tour and doing a support tour, but we're playing much bigger venues than on the headline tour. So that's nice. It's, showers and good food is much more common at the bigger venues and yeah and the people have all been really nice and uh you know uh how i i found out about kind mikla and you personally because uh you, they had uh uh not an interview but the tour bus uh uh in chicago i think they were showing the tour bus, right? Mm -hmm. And they were like showing like, uh, this is our tour bus, this is our driver, this is our merch person should be here, Kenneth mm -hmm. is somewhere, somewhere, you know? I'm like, okay, you know? And I didn't know, no, I kind of knew Ken and Mikla, you know? But then it's kind of, I just wanted like, oh, I didn't know that the merch person, like, it, I mean, sometimes yes, sometimes no. And then I Instagrammed to you, I found you on Instagram, like, ah, okay, so you were like, dedicated to merch you know this is your thing it's my thing <laughs> yeah. yeah it's not always that bands have uh, always the same merch person yeah. and i mean i was also just i think lucky that the girls were always taking me because uh, sometimes it probably was not financially the best decision to always have a fourth person with them but i don't know it's <laughs> no, I mean, but that helps. more money on the merch, but still, you know, I don't know, different situations, but... Are you good at selling merch? Yes. I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, of, like, of course, someone who knows the band is going to be better at, like, I know everything about everything, you know, if anyone asks a question, that's also what bothers me so much about the concession sales, mm -hmm. is that it's a person that doesn't know anything about the band, and especially because on this tour, like, not necessarily many people who come to the show know us, so... I want people to be able to ask like, oh, like, yeah, anything about the band. But if it's not me there, they're just going to be like, I don't know. Just whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it happened to you recently that that uh, uh, it was not to you, but somebody else were selling the merch or? Uh, yeah, it's been 10, 10 of the shows on this tour. 10 out of 24 are concessions. So other yeah. people are selling and you don't have anything. The yeah. first one I was like, can we like fight this somehow? But no, basically. <laughs> you it's a deal, yeah. 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 And I could see that you were like, kind of complaining how they put the shirts not pretty uh, it's like yeah. bit... <laughs> at some of the i will shout out to the two ones in spain they put up the stuff really nice and did a really good job but some of them before that was like yeah it's just it's it's frustrating to watch someone do your job worse than you and they're getting paid sometimes more well 
I don't know, someone's getting paid more than me, not necessarily the people that are standing there selling them. And especially when you're there to do specifically everything great and someone else does it poorly. And... Yeah, and it sucks for the girls. They're paying me and I don't even get to be there. And yeah, it's frustrating. <laughs> frustrating. Uh, hopefully it will change for the better. I don't know. So uh, do you have any plans to go beyond design music? To make music? No, no plans. No plans. So what about going beyond design in uh, visual arts? Yeah, I mean, I think design and visual arts is kind of the same. Animation? Animation. I mean, I do some animation. I did, I was also doing the live visuals for Kalamikla for a while. I was like live VJing them and um, the last, the latest visuals, I was art directing them and working with a visual artist. Yeah, I mean, you're pre pretty much credited on everything visually related to with Kylie Mikla, but you also work with other artists. Yeah. Yeah, you design, you design logos and stuff. Yes, logos, album covers, posters. All you're still the... based in Leipzig? Yes, I am. <laughs> Did you come to go, go to Leipzig? Because when I found out, I was like, why Leipzig? Yeah. I mean, you were in Berlin before. Yeah, it's super rent. Well, I was in Leipzig first because... Studio. I was applying for exchange studies and somebody told me about this school and... I didn't get into my first two choices, and then all of a sudden I was in Leipzig. I'd never been to Germany or anything. And then I uh, moved to Berlin for two or three years, and then went back to Leipzig because it's cheap as yeah. fuck to live there. <laughs> Sounds like was also in, in Berlin, right? Uh, yes, you? we lived together in Berlin, and then she also we went to Leipzig together and lived together for one year there. Then she moved back to Iceland, and I'm still there. Mm -hmm. Is there any benefits regarding the... I don't know, like traveling or something like like business related, uh, work related, being in Leipzig. It's traveling is a bit annoying because there's not, I mean, there is an airport, but usually I have to go to Berlin to fly, which is annoying. But I mean, it is in kind of in the middle of Europe is cool, but mostly it's uh, living there allowed me to start freelancing mm -hmm. way before like if you watch any YouTube video about like how to start freelancing, it's always like, you know, save up all this money and have three months of rent and, you know, whatever before you start because it's hard and your uh, income is not guaranteed. But when I was living there, like the first place, my rent was like 200 euros a month. So I could always somehow, even if I'd got just one project a month, you know, I could scrape together the money. But if I'd been living somewhere more expensive, I would have not have been able to just go into freelancing <laughs> like I did. Does your, like, uh, like your connection to Kyle and Mikla helps you with the uh, freelance? Do people more know about you? Yeah, for sure. And also just, I learned everything by doing stuff with them. I mean, yeah, I got to make like a record cover, and, you know, as one of my first projects. And then, you know, when they go on tour, I was making their posters, I made them, I learned how to make everything with them. And they always trusted me, you know, to make shirts and make stickers and make everything. So that helped. And then, of course, touring with them, I meet other bands. And so for sure, yeah, definitely. Well, I wish you all the best regarding that. All right. Uh, don't want to bother you too much. Uh, could you, I don't know. What's interesting is like you're not a musician. So usually I ask musicians if they can give me a song that they put at the end of the interview. Choose any song that a good introduction to your personality that I will put at the end of this interview, which is really hard because <laughs> you're not a musician. <laughs> I'm panicking. <laughs> yeah, that's really hard. I'm not going to leave until you give me an answer. <laughs> Do people usually pick their own songs or? Well, because I interview only musicians. All yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're the first, actually, yeah, you're the first non musician. Oh, nice. Yeah. I'm always surrounded by musicians <laughs> and people are always also asking me. Uh, but you can't take uh, Kylan Mikla or the people. Yeah, Kylan Mikla, no. Maybe somebody with whom you worked. But Kylan Mikla, no, because there we have to, one more song from them. The, the song that is my personality. Is that what you said? Yeah, like a good <laughs> introduction to who you are. Well, I think it's kind of unfair to not be able to choose Callum Mikla because I feel like that's so ingrained into who I am. Okay, give me a Callum Mikla song. Hallo, Sjartman.
Thank you again, Kyle Mikla. And thank you, Birch Babe. And now let's talk to Ville. My name is Ville Hermani Valo, also known as VV, the former singer of a Finnish hard rock band called Him. Well, uh, pleasure to meet you. First of all, congrats on the release. I, I see we're like surrounded by the vinyls that you need to sign for the mm-hmm. dedicated fans that are standing outside. We just came to, to the venue and we all saw them. I, I, I've i never experienced that. So for me, it was, uh, oh. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've, 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 I just paid assistance. Ah, that's why. To the people, so they just like line. Well, that's why they didn't let us in. Okay. <laughs> that's what, yeah, that's called branding. Yeah, so congrats on the album. Uh, my favorite song, Saturnine, S- Saturnine, Saturnalia. Oh, that one, okay. And you know why? Because... Um, we because tonight. Yes. Because of the world. Because you mentioned once that uh, you like to create the world. It's like world exercise, you know, building exercises in it, music. And uh, as, at its best, you know, is... Uh, movies and stuff like that you know that it can really suck you in and have its own exactly so when when, when i heard the song it felt like there are characters in there there's a oh, world nice. there's space in there that's what i mean it's like I do this understand, yeah. yeah it's 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 a song that uh the, you you can dive in and have the images in your head it's also also possibly due to the fact that it's a bit slower it gives the listener some time to think you know, a lot of times, especially modern music is very hectic, so there's a lot of stuff going on all the time, and that might be, you know, you you have to listen to the whole song and then think about, like, what did I just listen to? But with uh, Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live, for example, it has a nice flow and it has some space for you to sort of get into the mood, maybe a tap better. And plus, it feels like a Black Sabbath. I mean, you you like Black Sabbath yeah. and Depeche Mode? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it feels like uh, the sound of like the Black Sabbath, let's say in this in the song, is is like one character, and the sound of your voice in in the small melancholy is another character. Yeah. I mean, that's why I'm I'm a visual type. I make music videos, so yeah. I always think how I could work with that. And 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 that is like feels like a full short movie, oh, like short film. Cool. So that's why I like, and uh, of course I like the neo noir. So oh, these right. two songs are my yeah. favorites on the album. Yeah, but there's something so, you like. You know, it's it's a hard hard ask <laughs> after all these years to make some music that people dig. So actually, I wanted to ask this because uh, from all the interviews that I heard recently, you did a lot of interviews. Quite a bit, yeah. Uh, it's, it's this time with with Zoom. It's incredibly easy to do yeah. way more. You know, back in the day, I remember because you used to travel to every radio station separately and took like five hours on a you know Deutsche Bahn, especially in Germany, where you had to go to like the deepest Bavaria, you know, somewhere just for a two second interview, just say, hi, my name is and, and yeah, uh, please buy my album. It's coming up soon. That's that sort of a thing. Yeah, it's changed quite a bit. I, I think it's uh, there's pros and there's cons. You know, you miss the travel, you miss meeting new people and seeing new cities and all that stuff. But uh, you get a lot of information out there. For example, I prefer live interviews because I can be here, I can see your show, and yeah. uh, and Zoom is a little bit detached. There's lag. I yes. I, I, I don't I now I, don't I, have. I, I honestly think that the the biggest problem is the lag, the delay. I in, hate in the audio. It. Yeah, because it and, and it's actually going to be funny. Our young, you know, there's like these days there's uh, young singers who actually sing like they auto-tuned when they're not, because they've grown up with that sort of music. So I've been wondering, does the lag actually influence younger people to communicate? Because the, the, the modern way of communicating due to the lag is like monologues. You can't have a dialogue because of a, because of a delay. So it's only a monologue. You present your idea, then you wait for the next one to present their idea. It's not like throwing off, you know, finishing each other's sentences and stuff. You can't really do that. So I was wondering if that's a next evolutionary step it's possible. It's not only the lag, it's the voice messaging, you know, like when on WhatsApp or Telegram or some of this, you, you send an audio message, you present your idea, and then the other person needs to present an idea. So yeah, right, yeah, yeah, I, I don't use that, but, but then that, that's not too far away from letters. It's just quicker. It's just quicker. Yeah. And it feels it, it's like typewriter letters. Okay. Fair enough. We've, we found a compromise. We found a compromise. <laughs> uh, re- regarding the songs, uh, so coming back what I discovered from the interviews, when you describe your experience of presenting the first three songs to the public, the new ones mm-hmm. that you did last year, right? Like the first three, the secret, uh, uh, the surprise EP, right? Yeah, and yeah. Well, the first EP that came out that came out already in twenty twenty. So it's been a while. Uh, the the, the, the three uh, the three songs that are in this album, right? Yeah, they yeah. came they came out when the lockdown started. 
So uh, I started working on that stuff 2019, and then we put it out without knowing that COVID is going to hit. And uh, they came out, I think it was April 2020. We run away from the sun, salute the sanguine, and then the one you like, Saturn and Saturnalia. Yeah. So. so my question is, like, when you describe this process, it feels like well, how you uh, deal with the music, is it, it reminds me of a regular musician these days who, who made the music in their bedroom, and presenting the music to the public for the first time. Right. How, how did you feel? Because for you, it's it, it, because you wanted to see what, what is the reaction to, to, to these songs. But it's the same, in the same way, it's like starting from all over again, because you're expecting the maybe. I'm, uh, how, how did you feel? Um, yeah, the only difference, my bedroom is humongous. <laughs> I'm a relic from the 90s, so I can still afford that back in the day. But uh, uh, Well, I think you always have to have that thing. It, it doesn't matter how many albums you've done and what the format is. It doesn't matter whether it's a streaming thing or if it's an album thing or is it a solo album or is it, if, if it's a band. There's always the butterflies, you know, always nervous. It's like going in front of a class, you know, where you have to present something, which uh, I don't know anybody who actually liked it, mm -hmm. you know. So, um, so it feels a bit like that. But it's also, you know, music is what I do. That, that's what keeps me alive and that's how I survive and that's how I can deal with all this. So it's such an ingrained part, you know, of my, myself that I don't know any other way. So, um, so I got to keep on, you know, churning that stuff out and see what happens. Like, you know, like a Jackson Pollock sort of idea, you know, throwing shit on the floor and see what sticks. Yeah. I mean, you have to create, you're, you're an artist, you're a poet, you're a legend. So you have to do what you have to do, right? Yeah. 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 And the, the, the funny thing is that it's a, it's a good question, but it's a, The funny thing is that the answer is so simple. It is because I have to do it. No, absolutely. It's not even about because I get to do it. It is because I have to do it. So There's no other way. Not for me, no. I'm, I'm not a big believer in, in plan Bs or, or sort of thinking up parallel worlds or what might and coulda, shoulda, woulda sort of thing. I, I think that, you know, you know, throw yourself in the deep end and, you know, You'll manage manage out, out, out of there some way. Well, that's what I have. That's what I tell my friends: act or muerte, art or death. In a way, oh, yeah, yeah. not in a way that I, I want to kill people, mm -hmm. but it's like you have to keep moving in the art direction, other or yeah, and, and not not be afraid to 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 trust your guts and your intuition and really go for it. I think that that's the, that's the only way because then at the end of the day, your it's your art or it's your music or it's your filmography. Is nobody else's so you have to be proud of the decisions you've done whether whether it succeeds or not you know it's still the process is you know it's like a, you have to write a hundred shit songs to get them out of your system to be able to write that one good one so in essence the hundred shit songs are very very important because without those you wouldn't get to the good one i know that we're all looking for like a shortcut yeah. but uh, i think in creative arts it doesn't really happen unless you're max martin you know Yeah, I mean, it's a process. I mean, each, each person has its own process, of it course. Is. But in general, you need to, to have at least experience. It's, it's, part, it's part of the, of the thing. You need to try a lot of stuff, experiment. Maybe something comes up, maybe something sticks. You don't know. Indeed, indeed. But yeah, but still, I think it's very, very important to keep on doing that. Even if you do find your comfort zones, you have to be always... I, I find my sweet spots are right on the very cusp of of the comfort zone and the abyss. Because, you know, to keep myself on my toes and, and, and be, be surprised and be a bit scared because you have to, you know, it's like, it, that makes me feel alive, I guess. When you mentioned the abyss, because I have a question regarding the abyss, is because when you uh, uh, were recording this uh, album alone, it was you and the music, right? So, and the music is continuation of who you are and, the, and you are the continuation of the music in a way. When you stare into the abyss, the, the abyss stares back to you, right? Yeah, yeah. And my question is, like, have you discovered something new about yourself in this process through the music that you were composing? Something that you maybe you didn't expect? Um, maybe what I did, I sort of like rediscovered my love for music and the intimacy that can be with music and with creation. You know, a lot of times in bands and with a career, so to speak, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of, you know, stuff that gets in the way, you know, meetings and, you know, other people's needs and whatever, you know, that take, take away the focus from the essential, which in my case is music. So I, I think that that was the learning process. I sort of like um, um, learned how to listen to music again with child's ears. And that's quite beautiful, I find it, and quite endearing that I could find it as, um, as hard, you know, as sort of 
as sentimental and as touching and as meaningful as I did when I was a kid. You know, so the sort of like I, I think the pandemic and the fact that I need to, I need to work on this by myself made it made me lose the sense of routine, which which is a blessing. So that was a good thing, you know. So, but, uh, wait, uh, lose the sense of routine, but you still were in a routine while you were composing this, uh, or was it a different kind well, of routine? Well, it, it wasn't regimented, and then at the end of the day, I had to um, I had to. There were so many obstacles all the time because I'm not a recording engineer, you know. So it was all the time there was something new. Of course, there's a there's a routine of you brushing your teeth every morning, but you know the sort of like automatic stuff we do. So I didn't go that far into the realm of art. I started to do like the Lee Scratch Perry and walk backwards for a month just see how it feels. So maybe that's for the next album. I know that you try to go deep uh, when composing the music. As a, you like to go deep when in, in, in the depth of, of uh, 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 constructing the music. How deep did you, did, did you go like really deep that you were lost in the song? You have to, you have to get lost in the song. I was thinking deep in, as in like centimeters or feet. You know, it was way more than six feet under. Uh, uh, I think you have to, get lost and that's once again the thing that since there was no noise there was no distraction um uh, uh i was able to let myself sort of go which is great you know so like waking up a couple of hours later like with you know drool dripping from your mouth and be all like weird red-eyed bleary-eyed crazy bastard with hair all wonky like einstein at his best and uh and uh and all of a sudden there's something you know playing from the speakers it's, it's Quite a magnificent journey, I think, with the, with each and every song, and and it's like the best gigs are that you don't really remember them. You know, you're lost in the moment, and you're lost in, and you need the routine to be able to pull those certain things off that you don't fall off the stage, or you can. Well, it's before the gig, so I can't really promise you that I'm going to stay in tune. But basically, you know, the the basic idea is that you get that stuff out of the way, and then you can just lose yourself in whatever you're doing. Oh, when you mentioned routine and uh, and I thought about the touring, where are you mentally when you're performing on stage? Um, home. Yeah, ho hopefully it's a, like a it's a comforting place, and it's a it's um it's um it's a place where you don't have to think about where to buy the next toilet paper roll from. You know, it takes that sort of like out of the equation, that sort of the your regular pressures and and uh, and worries. It's a it's a quite a free state, but it takes time as well because it's it's not easy, and, and we're a bunch of people. And then there's a lot of uh, variables, the audience and the and the sound of the place and everything. So that takes routine and that takes uh, you know experience. So to be able to filter that out and hopefully to get into the mood that that sort of like being like a lava lamp, you know, just like you're you're there. And do you change your set lists? Uh, because I know, like when I interviewed yeah. Clutch, uh, the band Clutch, they they like to change the set list every day. Right. Yeah, yeah, because they, it keeps them on the toes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not me. Not me at all. Uh, I used to be really sort of nervous about set lists all the time uh, went, went with him, um, especially in the early days. And we kept switching it around a lot. But uh, what usually happens with that is that, or in other words, we've built this set to be like a roller coaster ride. It has a lot, a lot of like ebb and flow, and it's it's uh, to and fro, and it's it, it's quite a demanding task to have the flow in its right place, and then you have to play gazillion times for it to really be second nature. And uh, I believe that's better because then at the end of the day, there's not so many people who are going to see the gig several times. So it's better to play a great set and play really, really well. It's like um, like people thinking about why, why aren't you playing like B-sides, some random tracks from random years. And it's, it's great fun, but you know in the audience, like 99% won't know those songs, so they won't resonate. And then again, at the end of the day, when you're playing a gig, you, you're hoping for it being a you know a collective party you know and and the music just being the it, the it has to be a perfect soundtrack like a good playlist so to speak so so it's a i appreciate both ways the the fact that you can switch stuff around but uh but with this one i, I haven't dared yet plus it is uh the first solo album so to speak uh and it's a new band and it's a new technical crew as well so we've only played just the 16th show plus three in helsinki so it's not much and it's good to get all the technical aspects and all that stuff out of way so we can really get down to the nitty gritty. Mm -hmm. We have we have a few, a few ideas and a few other songs rehearsed, but we still don't want to mess about it too much, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, I want to ask you, uh, really important, because it's, it deals with, because I try to ask questions that will be useful for other musicians and creative individuals. How do you deal with fame and with sudden attention? Because when, when you suddenly, 
for example, so, uh, a TikToker that blows up yeah. and has a lot of pressure. I mean, and not many people can answer this question, but you are one of them who have been through the, the grinder of popularity and fame. How is it possible to, to, to properly deal with that? Firstly, I think the, if, if it is possible, I've, I've been wondering how it is for solo artists yeah. when you're actually by yourself. It must be terribly hard. And I, I've, I've been thinking about people like Justin Bieber, mm -hmm. you know, starting really young and being like super, super duper famous or, or Ed Sheeran or whatever, that they can maintain their sort of, sort of like psychological sobriety, that they're sort of, mm -hmm. you know, everybody's a bit wonky at times and we don't have the best of days every day. But uh, um, but uh, I think in my case, it was the band. We were really good friends. So there was that support from really close by and then being fans, the liquid support. So, but that I don't recommend because um, uh, you lose more than you gain, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Well, family, friends and surrounding people, the most important mm -hmm. probably. Yeah, I think so. And then it's exactly what we just said, people who can tell you straight and uh, what they mean and, uh, you know, that's, that, that the criticism is hopefully constructive. Yeah, and, it's, and, and at the end of the day, as a human being, you don't have to be an artist. You know, it's, it's fantastic if you do have a support system, if you have a family or if you have good friends. Not a lot of people do have good friends. You know, you might have gazillion, bazillion social media friends, but that's a, that's a different thing. As somebody you can actually tell everything you, you're feeling at whatever given moment, whether it's positive or negative. So, so but that, that, that helps. That helps. All right. Really, last ask is not a question could you please give us a song that i'll put at the end of this interview a Ville Valdo song that's a good introduction to your band oh man that's always the hardest one you know i have to i have to um give it to you for like in saturnine and saturnalia and i'm talking about worlds and world building and because that was a big deal that was a big deal for me and there was a big inspiration thinking about that stuff so so saturnine and saturnalia you get a good idea uh, it's a bit more rocking, the album is a bit more, you know, tempoed up, um, but um, that gives you a nice idea. It's good. It's a good way to waste seven minutes of your life. <laughs> Perfect. Could you please say the, the title of the song again with a feeling and attitude? Oh, uh, with an attitude? Yeah. Do you want me to uh, introduce the song? Just the title of the song. Saturnine Saturnalia.
Thank you, Villevallo. And thank you, dear listener, for staying till the end. Don't forget to follow this podcast if you dig it. Don't forget to rate the show on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, or any other platform. Please rate it, it helps a lot. More stuff to come. Until next time, stay safe. Bye.